Let me give you a very simple example of uh, quantum interference in action. Of course, I can talk in principle about uh, double slit experiment, which is a standard textbook example. But for the purpose of this course, uh, let me describe a different kind of experiment. I would like to show you how the interference works, not in external degrees of freedom, but internal degrees of freedom of, of individual atoms. So, so take an atom and select two levels, um, say the ground state and the excited state. So this, is, this little icon is my two-level atom, call it. And, uh, and let this atom uh, travel with uh, fixed velocity through three areas, which I represent here by, by those uh, three squares here. Um, so those are cavities where you can trap electromagnetic field. The two external cavities are tuned to the resonant frequency of the atom, so they would actually induce transitions between the ground and the excited state in the atom. The central cavity will um, not in the, the, the electromagnetic field there will be actually off resonance, so it will not induce any transition between the excited and the ground state, but it will introduce some phase shifts. It's called a dispersive interaction, and, and here we have a resonant interaction. So the atom starts in the ground state, and it goes through the first cavity, where it interacts with the light there, and that uh, interaction takes atom from the ground state and tries to push it into the excited state. But as it happens, the time of the flight is chosen so that it doesn't quite go to the excited state, but stays somewhere in between. And then there's the central cavity where the atom experience will experience phase shift. So different energy levels will somehow be modified for a short period of time. And then um, you can attribute uh, different additional phase shifts to those energy levels. And then finally, we have exactly the same cavity as the first cavity. The third one is exactly the same as the, as the first one, where you have uh, resonant interactions where the system is trying again to um, drive the, the atom between those two different energy levels. So finally, we have measurement, um, and we want to see whether the, uh, the atom is in the ground state or the excited state. Experimentals do, can do it via some selective ionization or some other process, which is of no great interest to us at the moment. So I would like you now to understand what's going on in this uh, experiment. And we are going to follow the energy level. So this is our ground state. Um, and this is our excited state. And the atom initially starts in the ground state. And we want to know what is the probability that the system, the, in this case, the atom will be detected in the excited state. So we want to know what is the probability that it will go from here to here. So this is excited, and this is a ground state. Now, uh, of course, uh, we follow the rules and um, we have to calculate the probability amplitude for the transition from this input to this output here. And you can easily see that there are two alternatives here. So the atom can go into the first cavity and in the first cavity can experience with certain probability amplitude 1 over square root of 2 can experience a transition to the excited state and then will propagate in the excited state, will get a phase shift, carry on in the excited state, and then comes the, the second resonant interaction. And in this case, the atom will just remain in the excited state. So it will just propagate this way all the way to, um, to, to, the, um, to the end. So in this case, let's look at the probability amplitude for this path. So the the first transition here it can happen with a probability amplitude uh, 1 over square root of 2. So let me just write alpha. The probability amplitude will be equal to. So 1 over square root of 2, so that's the first segment. The, third, the second segment here is the phase factor Ei phi 2. And then we have uh, the third segment, the transition here which es essentially leaves the atom in the excited state, is happens with probability minus 1 over square root of 2. OK, but then there's, of course, another path. So what can happen is in the first cavity, atom can actually carry on in the ground state, then can go through the 
phase uh, shift in the in the central cavity with uh, where the phase shift will be phi 1 and here in the second resonant cavity it will with probability amplitude 1 over square root of 2 go to the excited state and then will end up in the excited state so in this case we have the first transition the first segment 1 over square root of 2 that's the probability amplitude that the atom will stay in the ground state then we get the phase shift y ei phi 1 and uh, we have the uh, the second uh, resonant cavity where the atom goes to the excited state with probability amplitude 1 over square root of 2. Right, so then we want to find the probability, we take mod square of this expression. So p is equal to alpha mod square and uh, we can see if we take mod square of this it's going to be equal to 1 over 4, right? This expression here will also give us uh, 1 over 4. And uh, the remaining part can be written as minus 1 over 4 cos phi 2 minus phi 1. So essentially the, the probability is equal to 1 over 2 minus actually it's going to be 2 cos phi 2 minus phi 1 so it's going to be 1 over 2 minus 1 over 2 cos phi where phi I just write phi equal to phi 2 minus phi 1 so that is equal to sine squared phi over 2 so as you can see, the um, the probability is really, really controlled by the phase difference phi between um, the, the the phase shift that the atom gets in the excited state and the phase shift it gets in the ground state. We can recognize those two terms as the probabilities that uh, the atom follow one path or the other, and we can see the interference terms that does all the difference to this experiment makes it actually really interesting. Um, it, is, it is interesting to see that it is actually the central cavity that controls the whole um, probability, that controls the output. Depending on the, on the setting um, in the central cavity, you can, as, as you can see here, if uh, the difference is equal to zero, then uh, sine is equal to zero, so this transition will not happen. The atom that starts in the ground state will end up in the ground state. Um, but uh, as soon as, you know, as if you put phi equal to pi, then, uh, then you can get this transition for sure. So that's, uh, that's, that's, that's an interesting fact. And of course, if phi is somewhere in between, that uh, you have a probability sine square phi over two, uh, that this transition from the ground to excited state will happen. The pattern that you can see here, um, the resonant interaction, dispersive interaction, resonant interaction, um, you will see over and over again when we look into a very simple uh, quantum computation with, a <coughs> with uh, what we call later single qubit. But uh, I would like to draw your attention at uh, what are the roles of, of, of the three cavities here. So the first one, of course, uh, prepares uh, the, the superposition. It actually gives you uh, two different paths. It opens quantum interference. And then comes the central cavity, the dispersive interaction. It's quite important because what it really does, it controls the whole process. It, it's really what happens here in the center that will determine what will happen at the end. Now, um, the, the third cavity, the second resonant cavity, is very important because it closes interference. So the first one opens quantum interference and this one <coughs> brings the two paths together. So as you can see, we, due to this interaction, we just have those paths converging here and uh, we look at the energy level E. So the first one opens quantum interference, the central one really controls the whole thing and the third one closes quantum interference and therefore um, uh, 
we have to um, use uh, our quantum formulas just to get the probabilities.